Greetings! I want to start this video with a trigger warning of sorts. I'm going to be talking about substance abuse, death, and a couple of other really fun topics. <laughs> I want to try and be sensitive to those who have suffered from such things. Addiction and substance abuse affects everyone differently, and the process of managing and overcoming it varies wildly. I just don't see a whole lot of people talking about it candidly, which is what I want to do today. So that's my content warning now. On to the funny stuff. <laughs> Addiction is a funny thing. Not funny haha, -ha, more like funny... Uh oh. I'm an addict, and as an addict, at a certain point I started to see my substance abuse as kind of like a discipline. Not so much the participation, as it's relatively easy to get a buzz on if you know the right people or have 18 bucks to spend on a 30 rack of Keystone. The discipline came from hiding it and acting as though there was no addiction. Like CIA spycraft for drug use, those skills ultimately get better with time. Addiction is also similar to some other disciplines in that it's a huge money pit. <laughs> Another uh-oh funny thing about addiction is that it requires commitment and dedication to maintain. And yet there is no tangible benefit besides getting a buzz on for a few hours, or worst case, going on a bender for days. If you're a photographer, for example, the equipment that you buy has intrinsic value as it can be used to create something with each use. Or woodworking, you start by whittling a pipe, and then maybe a birdhouse, and then a gun rack or a canoe. At each phase of the skill tree, you end up with a pipe, a birdhouse, and a canoe, or a gun rack, and now you can live out the rest of your life like a Sasquatch man in the woods somewhere. Every single white man's dream. <laughs> and your skills and equipment must be honed and upgraded with each new endeavor. You gain new insights into how to chisel better or the usefulnesses of different types of wood and to use this tool over that tool. So it goes with addiction, except it's usually just trying to find where and when and how you're gonna get your next fix. You might start smoking weed out of a crushed up tin can. New skill! Or you realize straws can be used for other things besides sipping milkshakes. New skill! Before you know it, you're piecing together your own snuff kit and microwave waving dinner plates. <laughs> New skill? <laughs> I have suffered from addiction and still do every day, and while it was relatively easy for me to quit and get sober, it's still something I need to be mindful of all the time. I was able to quit because one day it all just became very depressing. Days that turn into days, constant brain fog, and thinking I was gonna die on more than one occasion. This is dark. <laughs> So why am I talking about addiction? Well, in April of this year, John Mulaney released Baby J, his most recent Netflix special. The entire show is basically him talking about and poking fun at his weird couple of years where he relapsed and went to rehab. He had a pretty chaotic series of life-altering events where he divorced his wife, had a child with another woman, and made a few bizarre late-night talk show appearances that culminated in a star-studded intervention. Mulaney has been very open about his struggle with addiction since day one, and despite his out appearance and demeanor, you'd assume it was something pretty inconsequential or maybe rather tame because he looks like a rom-com <laughs> substitute teacher. Or lies because comedians lie for attention. Becoming sober can be hard, but admitting you have a problem out loud is sometimes even harder. Saying the words, I'm an addict, is a strange thing because society tends to blame a person's character, whatever that means, for them becoming addicted in the first place. The idea that addiction is just a lack of willpower or some character flaw or that the addict is just lazy is so infuriating. My addiction partly comes from my genetics. I'm Irish and Scottish with a little bit of English imperialist scum thrown in there for good measure. Three cultures known for their ability to really put a pint away. I'm also an only child who grew up with an intrinsic amount of anti-authoritarianism and complacency and directionless in my younger years. It doesn't help that I was also sold a lie that I could be anything I wanted when I grew up. I was scared to say I had an addiction for a long time, but when I finally told a friend, I actually felt free. The hold my addiction had on me after that was somewhat diminished. There was a level of acceptance about my own struggle that made me feel like I was gonna be okay. It was one of many steps I would go on in my personal recovery, but I'm still nervous to talk about my addiction even now, almost two years into sobriety on such a public platform. The fear that I could get fired or become unemployable because of this video is very real. <laughs> Watching John Mulaney's special and how some of his Uber fans reacted to it reminded me just how stigmatized addiction is. Not only that, but how certain people using certain substances is almost an acceptable foregone conclusion in particular context. Got a date? Go to a bar! Friends are having a dinner party? Bring a bottle of wine. Transcontinental airline flight? 
get absolutely sloshed and pop a Xanax. These are all scenarios deemed acceptable by modern society to get absolutely blitzed at while ignoring the consequences and recognizing that it might be a sign of a deeper problem. I am fully aware that people can participate in these activities responsibly. Even myself, who always knew how many drinks were too many and could easily stop chugging whiskey sodas at a certain point. That point being that if even the thought of another drink made me gag. I've only blacked out like two or three times in my early 20s when I was sad and moody who on some psychological level was probably punishing myself for feeling sad and moody, but I was drinking a bottle of wine or a six pack of something every day. Speaking of young people getting drunk, can we stop putting alcohol in every non-alcoholic drink? The White Claw craze had its day in the sun and was a novel experiment that we initially all kind of looked at as Kind of corny, but accepted because honestly, they were delicious. <laughs> we were all kind of drinking them ironically, right? It was fun to try the Bud Light and Michelob seltzers, and hell, we were even okay with Topo Chico and Spindrift putting out their own alcoholic spiked seltzers as well, but we're all kind of over it, right? Unfortunately, this hasn't stopped companies from dumping cane sugar alcohol or straight up vodka into things like Sunny D. You know, the thing kids want more than they want actual orange juice. Sunny D should just call their new juice my first screwdriver. <laughs> Lipton and Simply are also getting into the spiked ready to drink market or RTD because we have to acronymize everything. As if we learned nothing from the jewel fiasco of marketing addictive products to children. Does no one see how selling spiked Sunny D might be a problem? <laughs> It's like if those bubblegum cigarettes from like the 1930s <laughs> had actual nicotine in them. And the only thing that differentiated those from the non-addictive ones were that they came in a slightly different shape and color. I mean, look at this branding. <laughs> I also always found it weird when parents would tell their kids that you can drink as long as you do it with me first, as if that somehow absolves the fact that alcohol literally interferes with cognitive and neural development. On top of that, drug and alcohol consumption in media makes it seem like a rote activity. Many teen movies depict high school parties as if they were thrown by a deranged Willy Wonka frat house, where bottomless beer barrels are always ready for a keg stand and 30-year-old teenagers relentlessly grind on each other. The average high school has maybe one person that looks like they were carved out of marble. I have never in my life been to a party that even slightly resembles Can't Hardly Wait. More often than not, these parties take place in some field or in a barn where the cast of Squidbillies are mudding in their four-wheelers. I should know, I grew up in Northern California. That is an accurate depiction. Unless you're getting scared straight watching Requiem for a Dream, most of the times movies depict using other substances like cocaine as just a fun upper. You talk real fast and come up with wacky plans that lead to wackier hijinks. Which is all true, but it's usually used in the service of a joke and we rarely see the aftermath of what it looks like to drain your entire brain and body of dopamine and serotonin. Nor could it, but minimizing the effects of using as some lighthearted activity makes it seem like a victimless indulgence. This is also bizarre and contradictory as people with addiction often become social pariahs not the captain of the football team. <laughs> we're either paranoid that people at a party are gonna be freaked out by how often we're using the bathroom, or that they're gonna want us to share. Addicts are all too often forced to hide their addiction rather than comfortably seek treatment or even admit that they have a problem thanks to society. It's as if society says, it's okay to do drugs, just don't get addicted. Mulaney's special has an entire bit about this exact thing. He tells a story about having to steal his own money in order to use it to buy drugs because he was so paranoid about anyone finding out about his relapse. In August of 2020, I was very strung out, I desperately wanted cocaine, and I realized I still had a credit card that worked. And I decided I was going to buy a Rolex watch with my credit card and pawn it for cash five minutes later. It's why we have so many functioning alcoholics. <laughs> People tend not to care about another person's problems as long as they don't have to see it because it makes them feel icky. <laughs> or how people are quick to blame somebody being unhoused or unsuccessful because they're probably a junkie. All while ignoring instances of very successful drug addicted people just like Mulaney. Cherry picking examples to justify some moral war is disingenuous when 
The issue is so much more complicated than that. Which reminds me, do you remember back in the 80s when Richard Pryor set himself on fire while freebasing cocaine? The news just laughed and said, oh, that Richard Pryor, he'll do anything for a laugh. <laughs> you know, but I don't know how people can just write up a lie. They just take it well, and they make it up to South. If you don't give them an interview, when they want one, they just say, They'll make a story. Well, the hell would you, Jack? Check this out. I mean, it was the 80s and everybody was shoveling cocaine into their face like it was going out of style, which, spoiler alert, it didn't. <laughs> Mulaney's special is a great comedic examination of someone's personal battle with addiction that doesn't minimize the issue or shift the blame. I think it's a great piece of work that will hopefully shed more light on what addiction looks like and then it has many forms. It's not always a stereotypical tweaker with a face tattoo. Which brings me to the people who've gravitated towards Mulaney's persona in the first place. For a long time, he was considered one of the good ones among what felt like a never ending sea of comedians doing some pretty heinous stuff. He wears suits, he's a bit of a dork, and looks like a ventriloquist doll was granted their wish of being a real boy by a witch. And despite telling his fans and audiences that he was an addict, they somehow feel betrayed that he's telling them in excruciating detail just how bad it actually was. Have a big like production meeting on something. Desperate to have a cigarette so like finding an abandoned office and smoking out the window and being almost very much in trouble and it being really clear. Those moments were so about surviving that that hour that they ne I never thought about them with any deeper perspective. I never thought oh my god what has my life become. So it was all just like figuring out the video game of being a drug addict. I understand that watching his special might be triggering or uncomfortable for some audiences, especially those still working on or struggling with addiction. When I was still using, but telling myself this was the last time for the 47th time, <laughs> and would see a movie depicting drug use, a part of my addiction brain would activate and I'd get a rush of adrenaline of memories of the past times that I'd gotten high and watched the sunrise, but like not in like a romantic, sort of sweet way. Addiction's fun. <laughs> so I fully understand people not wanting to hear the story he tells despite them not being framed in a positive way. All of Mulaney's jokes are never glorifying substance abuse, but for the people who are blissfully ignorant about addiction and the drug use of John, one of the good ones, Mulaney, they've developed a parasocial relationship. Mulaney is not an exception to the rule, nor is he the worst person in the industry. His fans have been called the worst for many reasons, but mainly that they seem to conflate John Mulaney the man and John Mulaney the persona. His personal life is not defined solely by his stand-up or the persona he wants you to see when he's on stage. He and everyone else on this planet are complex and complicated and messy people who make mistakes and suffer from addiction, mental health issues, trauma, stress, anxiety, and getting work messages that begin with, per my last email. Do not misunderstand me though, none of this excuses his bad behavior. I'm really good at writing really long sentences that I can't fucking remember. I'm strictly talking about his addiction and his fans' reaction to feeling disappointed in him rather than recognizing addiction and substance abuse is much more widespread than they may think. As you process and digest how obnoxious and unlikable that story is, just remember, that's one I'm willing to tell you. <laughs> My own mother suffered from substance abuse up until her untimely death. For all anyone knew, she was a well-respected and well-educated medical professional that was affable and strong-willed. Also, you could say stubborn. <laughs> no one would have ever suspected her of illicit drug use as a way to self-medicate. What my mother and myself and John Mulaney needed was for society to not judge such a life-threatening disease that constantly gets swept under the rug. And yes, I did just compare myself to John Mulaney. We needed a safe space to be vulnerable and talk about our addiction rather than hide it and let it slowly destroy us. Because of the enormous propaganda push of Western society, thanks to Nancy Reagan and Dare, addicts are often ostracized and find themselves outside the norm of society with the help of regular people who refuse to think critically about what they're being told. Some countries jail or execute drug abusers, which is eugenics. You're just doing eugenics. <laughs> and what even is the norm? Normalcy in late stage capitalism feels like a fairy tale that's been sold to us by corporations and the powers that be like Manifest Destiny or the American Dream or pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. An impossible task. <laughs> Not only are addicts questioned constantly for their character or morality in terms of why they're an addict in the first place, which can be filled with racist dog whistles and hateful rhetoric, horrible monsters say out loud that those people are deserving of punishment because of their addiction and that they 
have no place in mainstream society, which again is just eugenics. <laughs> this ignores the many factors perpetrated by mainstream society that have a direct influence on promulgating addiction among its citizens. Poverty, trauma, and general discrimination are all root causes that exacerbate addictive tendencies. There has also been some criticism of Mulaney's special for being nothing more than a PR stunt as it's unlike any of his previous specials. His delivery is more somber and low-key, which many have interpreted as more of a TED Talk apology than a comedy special. But it would be way weirder if he didn't address his very public relapse at all, or even a little. The audience wouldn't be able to look away from the 10-ton elephant leering over him the entire time. My other issue with the interpretation that it's nothing more than a PR stunt is, of course it's a PR stunt. He's a performer. Every special he puts out is a PR stunt. His job is making public relations funny. To be so dismissive of a special that discusses some hard truths is not only rude, it misses the point of comedy and performing in general. I looked right at it because I kept fucking the lineup. Stand-up comedy is performance art in the most simple of terms, and it can be a way for the performer to speak their truth in the hopes that it resonates with just one other person. It's why I make YouTube videos. I'm a whore for attention. But more importantly, because I want to talk about things I don't see a lot of other people talking about in an attempt to shed some light on them. Whether it's a sarcophagus tsunami bed or parasocial pet influencers. Real hard-hitting stuff. <laughs> there have also been some people saying that because it's a special about addiction that automatically glorifies his actions and by talking about them and making jokes he's trying to downplay them. I would like specific examples because it swings wildly from him coming across as a giant ass to someone who is clearly regretful. The jokes always land on him or the concept of addiction and never his victims. Comedy can be used to lighten the mood when talking about dark or tragic subjects. We often laugh when we're uncomfortable and seeing a comic tell their story and jokes about addiction on stage lets the audience feel that uncomfortability in a safe space without fear of being judged. By addressing it and granting permission to laugh abjures the tragedy and the hold it has on the viewer. This is not the same as glorifying. Good comedy points at the thing that hurts as a way to heal from it, or at the very least, better understand it. I'm glad Mulaney is still around to perform on a national platform much the same way people were glad that Richard Pryor was around to do the same. I'm also glad that people were discussing addiction across the internet and hopefully in their homes with loved ones when his special came out. There are many misconceptions about addiction and substance abuse due to the shame we as people have placed upon it. I looked right at it because I kept fucking the lineup. Addiction itself is not a shameful affliction, but a disease that some are more predisposed to be consumed by. I looked right at it because I kept fucking the lineup. It's also a discipline that you can get really good at, which you must unlearn and become disciplined and constantly fighting from acting upon. I kept, kept fucking the lineup. I also want to quickly point out that I'm not saying that drugs and alcohol should be outlawed. We know this doesn't stop people from using thanks to the experiments of D.A.R.E. and the war on drugs. If anything, it makes it worse. <laughs> Everything in moderation in a safe space with medical professionals would be ideal. We just need to realize that the act of getting high isn't shameful or wrong itself. Humans have been getting a buzz on for 10,000 years. However, getting high or drunk isn't an excuse for being a bad person. I started writing this script back in April and it's taken me a while because it's a pretty heavy topic and quite personal. <laughs> if you've made it this far, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And if you or someone you know is suffering from substance abuse or addiction, please use the resources that I've left in the description or reach out to those in need. Chances are, they probably just need someone to listen to them. I mean, that's what I needed. So that's the video. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and share and subscribe. Every one like equals one bong rip. That <laughs> seems appropriate. <laughs> All right, bye. Oh, how do I turn this off? Uh.